Chag Sameach. One of my favorite stories is of a brand new rabbi coming to town. And the rabbi is wondering whether it's the custom of the congregation to stand for the Shema or to sit for Shema Yisrael. So sure enough, the new rabbi, she arrives to town and it's a few minutes before it's time to say Shema. So she says, okay, congregation, please be seated for Shema. Well, wouldn't you know, one of the members of the synagogue pops right up and says, Rabbi, I know you're new in town, but we don't sit for Shema. We stand for Shema. This is our custom. Well, wouldn't you know, not 30 seconds go by that another congregant pops up and says, he's wrong. That's not true. We sit for Shema, and we've always sat for Shema. This is our custom. Of course, the other guy stands back up, argues back. No, we stand for Shema. This is our custom. The other guy pops up. No, we sit for Shema. This is our custom. And they're back and forth like this for a good minute or two. Finally, the new rabbi turns to her synagogue president and says, they're arguing back and forth about whether we sit or we stand for Shema. What's our custom here? The synagogue president says, we argue. This is our custom. <laughs> this, of course, is the story of the Jewish people. So I want to remind us that some of the strife and tension that we have today has always been the case. We're always arguing and disagreeing with each other. But that the winner of the argument gets to write the history book. The winner of the argument gets to write the history book. So allow me to rewind 2,000 or more years back to the days of the Maccabees. We know the story of the Maccabees. We talked about it just a few minutes ago when uh, the Maccabees under uh, the Hasmonean named Judah, right, comes and defeats the Greek Syrians. They reclaim the temple. They rededicate the temple. And what's interesting is the Maccabees, this Hasmonean family, not only take over as kings because now they've won this war, but they also claim to be high priests, right? They also claim to be high priests. And that seemed well and good and very efficient for a time, but we know our history that there's always been a wonderful division of power among our ancestors and leadership, that the high priests and the kings were very different people so that they could keep each other in check. So it becomes an issue when the Maccabees, the Hasmonean dynasty, take upon themselves both sovereignty and priesthood. And what we'll come to see is that the early rabbis really had a hard time with this idea, and especially when this guy named Alexander Janaeus, after a few generations, he takes over and he is a terrible man. Really just a terrible man and comes from real questionable heritage. Whether he's actually Jewish, whether he actually has any legitimate claim to the priesthood, which is a genetic position, whether he has any genetic claim to kingship, which is also a genetic position. And so the early rabbis will start to question this person's leadership. Now, you remember 2,000 years ago, there was real division among the Jewish people, which is by and large why the Romans were able to come in and defeat us and destroy our holy temple, right? It was because of the infighting among the Jews. So there is a person named Josephus who was a Jewish general, and he was the first Benedict Arnold, right? Maybe a Benedict Arnold scene because he was Jewish. And what he does is he leaves leadership of the Jewish people and he actually goes over to the Romans and becomes an informer on the Jews to the Romans. And in his role, he comes to write a history of the Jews, which we use often as a real uh, understanding of what happened 2,000 years ago. So we now turn to one of my favorite stories of Sukkot, and we'll start uh, with Josephus and the Antiquities of the Jews. As to Alexander, this person named Alexander Janaeus, we just talked about, he was the, uh, the Hasmonean leader, the Maccabee, who claimed both priesthood and kingship, who was of real questionable authority and certainly just a bad human being. Josephus writes, as to Alexander, his own people were seditious against him. For at a festival which was then celebrated, when he stood upon the altar and was going to sacrifice, the nation rose upon him and pelted him with etrogen, which they had in their hands, because the laws of the Jews required at the Feast of the Tabernacles, everyone should have branches of the palm tree and citron tree, which thing we have elsewhere related. They also reviled him because of his questionable ancestry and declared him unworthy of dignity and of sacrificing. At this he was in a rage and slew of them about 6,000. Okay, 
Now, before you turn the page over, does anything strike you as interesting about Josephus' relating of this story? He was very minimalistic in his description of the lulav, right? He just spoke about the palm, okay? He didn't mention the other two species that are part of the lulav. What else is interesting? Yeah. He came and slayed 6,000 people because of how they responded to him, right? He was a bad dude. Anything else interesting? First, I think it's interesting that how did the early rabbis respond to their disagreement with this person who claims to be the high priest and the king? They all threw their atrogam at him, right? Could you imagine? No offense, Chazan, but Chazan is leading right here. And everyone says, no, 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 no. This is not how we chant it, right? And everyone decides, okay, we'll just take our atrogam. Don't get any ideas, right? Don't get any ideas. Um, but what a response, right? What a response to the way we, we disagree. And what's interesting is how Josephus describes it also is these people were seditious. Remember, Josephus became a turncoat and was informing on the Jews to the Romans. So what was he accusing them of? Sedition. And it comes to inform the Roman oppression of the Jews um, throughout that first century of the common era. Okay? But I liked it because they pelted him with etrogan. All right. So, not that you should get any ideas, but we'll turn over to the next page and we'll see a similar story that comes from the Talmud, Masechet Sukkot. And now this is not Josephus, the Jewish turncoat writing. This is our rabbi's writing, some probably less than 2,000 years ago now, probably a few centuries after this story of Alexander Janaeus. What we need to know, too, to understand the story is that one of the customs of the holiday of Sukkot during the days of the Beit HaMikdash was the Simchat Beit HaShoeva. Right? We know that our tradition teaches that Sukkot is the time of year when God judges the earth for rain. And in particular, God judges the land of Israel for rain, which is life, right? Rain is life, rain is agriculture, rain is everything. As long as the right amount of rain comes in its season, everything grows, everything prospers. So to urge God along, there was developed this custom of Simchat Beit HaShoeva, this water libation festival, where the uh, priest would pour this water out as part of a ceremony, reminding God that God should also pour water out upon us, right? It's of questionable origin, though, where the Simchat Beit HaShoeva comes from, and probably was just folk custom that became part of the regular worship of the holiday of Sukkot. So here we are now in the Talmud. With regard to the rites of water libation performed in the temple during the festival, how was it performed? One would fill a golden jug with a capacity of three log, so about a liter and a half of water, with water from the Siloam pool. When those who went to bring the water reached the gate of the water, so-called because the water for the libation was brought through the gate leading to the temple courtyard, they would sound a tekiah, a teruah, and then another tekiah as an expression of joy. The priest ascended the ramp of the altar, turned to his left. There were two silver basins there into which he poured the water, right? Gold jugs, silver basins. This is no uh, recreational activity. This is a big deal. Rabbi Yudah said, they were limestone basins, but they would blacken due to the wine and therefore looked like silver. The two basins were perforated at the bottom with two thin perforated nose-like protrusions. One of the basins used for the wine libation had a perforation that was broad, and one used for the water libation had a perforation that was thin, so that the flow of both the water and the wine, which do not have the same viscosity, would conclude simultaneously. The basin to the west of the altar was for water, the basin to the east of the altar was for wine. However, if one poured the contents of the basin of water into the basin of wine, or the contents of the basin of wine into the basin of water, he fulfilled his obligation, as failure to pour the libation from the prescribed location does not disqualify the libation after the fact. Okay, everybody's ready now. Should the Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple, come into existence right now, each of you could go perform the water libation. Rabbi Yehuda adds, the basin for the water libation was not that large. Rather, one would pour the water with a vessel that had the capacity of one log on all eight days of the festival and not only seven. And the appointee says to the one pouring the water into the silver basin, 
raise your hand, right? As you're pouring this water, and then after you've poured your water, you raise your hand so that his actions would be visible. Why? Because there's one time a priest intentionally poured the water on his feet. As the Sadducees, the priestly class, did not accept the oral tradition, meaning the priestly class rejected the rabbinic tradition, requiring water libation. And in their rage, all the people pelted him with their etroging. Okay? So if the rabbi's doing something wrong, don't get any ideas. You can't throw your etrogium at him. But nevertheless, here we have another story of people being pelted with the etrog. Now my first question, is it the same story? It's unclear. Does this story in the Talmud ever mention Alexander Janaeus? It doesn't mention him at, one, at all. Does it question the genetic um, legitimacy of the Sadducee, of the priest, offering the libation at the time? No, it doesn't question it at all. Rather, it challenges his authenticity because he thought the whole thing was a joke, and he, they, they threw their etrogam at him because he thought they were rejecting the rabbinic tradition. Okay? And that's why they pelted him with etrogam. So one of two things is happening. Either we have a little bit of revisionist history going on, that the rabbis were saying, we had no problem with Alexander Janaeus. We had a problem with the halacha that he was performing. Right? So that could be one thing, and therefore they take out Alexander's name and they just talk about his disregard or disrespect for the oral tradition. Or, the other answer could be these are two entirely separate stories, and thus what was the custom among our ancestors? That when they disagreed with each other, they chucked their etrogim at one another. I don't know what the answer is. But what's fascinating is we Jews haven't always had a wonderful history of getting along with each other, but the good news is we're no longer throwing our etrogs one at the other. Yeah, Jim. It, I, I guess it, right, it, Bob Dylan's Everybody Must Get Stoned, right? That's what he was speaking about. Um, maybe not, maybe, maybe two different stories, right? That one story, two stories, we're not sure. Um, yeah, it was at the same time period. So I guess if that was your choice, being stoned to death or being pelted with etrogim, so therefore everyone, you can aim yours at Jimmy if, uh, if you disagree. <laughs> All right, with that we'll say Chag Sameach and keep your etrogim to yourselves.